In this video we're going to look at the inverse trigonometric functions and I want to just review the definition of the inverse of a function. We let f and g be two functions such that f of g of x equals x for all x in the domain of g and g of f of x equals x for all x in the domain of f. And if you remember um, we did we did work with inverse functions this semester at the beginning when we worked with exponential functions and log functions. And when you take the composition of a function and its inverse, the output will be x. Because basically what's going on is you have two functions and one is performing one function and the other one is undoing that. Um, so as far as graphing is concerned, um, if we look at an, al you know, an algebraic example of f of x equals x squared, and its inverse x equals y squared, or the inverse is the square root of x for x is greater than zero. Here we have, we have to restrict the domain of the original function, because remember, a function has an inverse as long as the function is one to one. And since the graph of f of x equals x squared is not a one to one function, we need to restrict the inverse so if we restrict it, the domain of f of x equals x squared to x is greater than or equal to, and we can include the equal sign here, we would just be focusing on one piece of this graph, which is this piece right here. Um, and that would be considered one to one. And if we think of some ordered pairs that were on the original graph, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, if those ordered pairs are on the original graph, remember that when you graph an inverse, you just change the x's and y's or interchange them. Now the first two functions, uh, first two ordered pairs are the same, but we'd have 4, 2. You know, if we had uh, 3 squared, which is 9, then we would have the square root of 9, which is 3. So a function and its inverse are also symmetric across the line y equals x. So if I graph the, the um, y, equals, y equals x squared for x is greater than or equal to 0, and here we have y equals the square root of x, and its domain is x is greater than or equal to 0, um, you can see the symmetry along the line y equals x. So this is a type of inverse that you looked at in pre-calculus 1. Again, we also talked about this relationship when we were looking at logs and exponents. Now we want to look at uh, the trigonometric functions. And we know that none of the trigonometric functions are one-to-one. -one. So we're going to have to restrict our domain. So let's start by looking at the graph of y equals sine x. And this window that I've chosen here is from uh, negative 2 pi to 2 pi. this scale um, is 1 on this graph. So what I'd like you to do is to just think about what I'm looking for a piece of this graph that will take on all the y values that the sine function um, takes on. So all the output values meaning every, every value from negative 1 to 1 in the y and I just want one piece of this graph such that it's 1 to 1. In other words, not only does it pass the vertical line test, it has to pass the horizontal line test, which this function does not do presently. So if you want to pause the video and think about it, just try to think of a piece of this graph that would be considered one-to-one. -one. What mathematicians have chosen to use as the restricted domain for sine is the piece of the graph from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. All right, we have a piece of that graph that is 1 to 1. Now this is really, this is your angle, right? We've got the angle on the x-axis and basically on the y-axis is the trig ratio. Right? We know that the sine of 0 is 0. We know that the sine of pi over 2 is 1. So these y values, the output values, are trig ratios. 
the input values are angles or real numbers. We can we we've already talked about the fact that we can take the sine of a real number. And I want to look at just three ordered pairs to start with because if I have three at least three ordered pairs on my original, then to graph the inverse I can just simply exchange the x's and the y's. So the three values that I've chosen to to use are negative pi over two negative one, zero zero and pi over 2, 1. So in my new graph, the x-axis is going to be the trig ratio, which used to be the output for the original graph. The y-axis is now going to be the angle. We're just swapping our x's and y's, so we're changing the, um, the x-axis and the y-axis. We're basically exchanging what those mean. Uh, and we're going to exchange these three ordered pairs, the x's and the y's. So my three new ordered pairs are going to be 1 pi over 2, 0, 0, and negative 1, negative pi over 2, and I'm going to graph those. So I'm going to go over 1 and up pi over 2, 0, 0, and then negative 1 down pi over 2. Now just looking at these, if I, that almost looks like it should be a, a straight line. What I'm going to do is we're going to look at the value at pi over 4 to give us a better idea and so the sine of pi over 4, if I want to graph this, uh, the sine of pi over 4, we know it's a square root of 2 over 2, but let's get the decimal value in case you've forgotten that. I'm in radian mode. The sine of pi over 4 is equal to approximately 0.7. So when I'm going to graph this point, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over 0 0.7. All right, this would be an extra ordered pair. I'm going to have 0.7 and then pi over 4. So I go over 0.7, which is, you know, halfway between a half and one is 0.75, so a little bit, a little bit shy of that would be our ordered pair. And so what we've got here, it's going to curve this way. And then I know that um, the sine of negative pi over 4, since sine is an odd function, is going to be negative 0.7. So I'd go negative 0.7 and down, giving me another order pair to help me see the shape. And so this is the graph of your inverse sine function. But I want to talk a little bit about the notation, because right here we have an angle on the on the x-axis in my original function and the trig ratio is the y-coordinate. Now over here we've basically just swapped the x's and the y's. And so here we have the trig ratio on the x-axis and the angle now is the output. If I start off with y equals sine x, remember in order to come up with a, an inverse we interchange the x's and the y's so we now say x is equal to sine y. So y is now the angle, x is the, um, is the trig ratio, where before y was the trig ratio and x was the angle, but this is not explicit. This is what we call an implicit function. We want to write some expression y is equal to. And so, so if we say this in words, y is basically the angle whose sine is x. Well, instead of, you know, in mathematics what they do is they come up with symbols to take over lots of language. So the y stays the same, the is is the equals, and this whole piece, the angle whose sine is x, all of those words are condensed into one symbol and that is the inverse sine of x. So when you see this expression right here, it means that y is the angle whose sine is x. And so now we have an input value of, which is a trig ratio, and the output value is the angle. Just like on your calculator, we use the inverse sine button when we knew the ratio, but we didn't know the angle. We are trying to find the angle. Before we evaluate inverse sine functions, I want to look at the restricted domain and range of the original sine function that we used.
So the restricted domain for sine was negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, and the range was negative 1 to 1. So now we'll look at the domain and range for the inverse sine function. And notation-wise, the inverse sine is one type of notation you can use, and y equals arc sine is also another notation that some books use, so I just wanted you to be familiar with both. The inverse sine with the negative 1 is the most commonly used. But what we know is that if you have changed x's and y's when you go from an original function to an inverse, that what was your range is now your domain, and what was your domain is now your range. And so the domain of the inverse sine function is negative 1 to 1, and the range of the inverse sine function is from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And in the next video, we're going to look at evaluating some inverse uh, sine functions.